You know, most attics in America look like this, where you've got a roof line, you've got some vents to the outside, and you've got some fluffy stuff on top of the ceiling drywall. Now, I'm down here in Texas, which means I don't have a basement, so all the ducts typically are also up here in this space. Now, this space in the summertime could get pretty dang hot. Pretty dang hot. Hot, hot, hot. Like 100 on the hot. Like Dang hot. Like 120, 130, maybe even more degrees. And the only thing separating this space from below is a little sheet of drywall and this fluffy insulation. This is a vented or an unconditioned attic. We've been building this way for decades, and this is a dumb way to build. We've got better technology, we've got better ways to build. On the build show today, I'm going to take you to two houses. One is mine under construction, and another one that I'm building for a client where we have built totally differently from this, where we're building conditioned attics that are unvented. Today's build show all about attics. Let's get going. Hey guys, do you know my friend Ken Allison from IDI Insulation? Ken, this is actually my house, and this is what we refer to us building science nerds as a conditioned or an unvented attic. Talk to me about what you're seeing here. What I see mostly is just a beautifully done attic. The idea of using rock wool up here as your insulation for this attic, the sound is tremendous. It's, it's really beautiful and I love the way you did the framing. But what's nice is this stuff staying in place, mm -hmm. you're gonna have just a beautiful insulation package up here. And what I don't feel is all of the humidity. Yeah. That's right. We're totally isolated from the outside, Ken, and so much so that it's actually raining outside and I've got a metal roof on. You can't hear anything in here. It's super quiet. And this will be, you know, my air conditioning system's not on yet. We're still under construction. This will basically be the same temperature as the rest of the house. It might be because of, you know, the stack effect or heat rising. This might be a couple degrees hotter. But if my thermostat below here is set at 72, I don't expect it to be more than like 75 up here. The, this is really a great job, and I know that they've talked about the need to have a vapor valve or something like that on a top of some diffusion port. Yeah, diffusion port on top of some of these. That's why I mentioned my first thought is I'm not really feeling the humidity up here. Mm -hmm. This is done so well, and there's so little outside air coming in. Like you said, it's raining. Yep. And this feels nice and dry. Yeah, it feels good in here. This yeah. is a great attic. And the cool part is this, we don't need to put a thermal barrier over it. Mm -hmm. So this is a very workable attic. You've got great storage in it. Mm -hmm. This is much better than a traditional build. And the other thing that you're gonna notice as you look into this attic, Ken, is that all my duct work is below the insulation. So the duct work is in the conditioned envelope of the house. It's in this unvented attic space. There's no gable vents, there's no ridge vents going on here. Any venting you might see in the outside is strictly venting the roof between the, the metal roof and the roof deck underneath it. It's not into this space. Everything's fully closed and sealed off. I've got a very airtight house. All my air conditioning lives in the same airspace as I do. It means my ducts aren't gonna break down. It means my house is, and my attic in particular, is free of bugs and pests and rodents and uh, the mouse poop and rat droppings you see in attics Absolutely. all over Texas, none of that's gonna happen in this space. I love that. And to look at your ductwork, this is stretched beautifully tight. So therefore you're not getting any loss there. Yeah. And if this were a traditional attic, like the ones that we normally see, you would have heat flow. Heat's gonna go from hot to cold. You would have heat flow from here going down into the house, mm -hmm. taking dust and all of that kind of stuff with it. You're not gonna have any of that in this. Yep. For sure. Now, Ken, you and I have been working on another project with a different type of insulation, but still a conditioned, uh, unvented attic. Let's meet you guys over at another project. All right, Ken, another house of mine under construction. My company's building this for some clients. They wanted some attic storage space, and when we designed this house with the architect, we designed this beautiful uh, space. Uh, One-story house, great amount of attic up here, and we use closed cell foam over here. Now we've got four inches at the roof deck here sprayed right on, and that's the beauty of closed cell foam is it sticks. I thought about using rock wool for this house, but there's a lot of complications on this project 
and I don't have a uh, thick exterior foam on the walls, although I do have four inches of polyiso on this roof, on the top side of the roof. But the nice thing of this spray foam, you can see as you look back here, no matter what way the roof cuts, it's really easy. The spray foam contractor just sprays it and it sticks right to the roof deck. This is also closed cell, so it's a really high R value per inch. It's around R7 per inch. 7.1. So we're like R50 basically between this interior foam and the four inches I've got on the outside. But talk to me, Ken, about what builders need to know, or homeowners for that right reason, about spray foam in an attic that you can have access to or that there could be storage in. The big thing about having foam like this anywhere, whether it's a shop, a barn, or a house, mm -hmm. is foam is liquefied plastic. Yeah. And cellular plastic can have fire go through it. Now there's two main differences in foams. You have thermal form and thermal set. So a thermal form foam, think of you know, your white, pink, or blue, your, your styrofoam type foams. Okay. okay, those foams will actually, when you heat them up to a certain temperature, they'll bend somewhere around 170, 200 degrees. They'll bend, they'll form, they'll shape. But somewhere over 300 degrees, they go up and they will actually propagate fire. That's the legal term. They'll take fire from one location to another. Mm. Okay, spray foams, on the other hand, are thermal set foams. Okay. So these will not... Uh, drip and rain fire, they'll only shrink and char. So one thing we want to do is take a look at that compared to when we put the coating on it because the coating is there. The coat sees all foams the same. Now there's, we haven't talked about the coating. What are you talking about by the coating? If the code official believes there's a reasonable expectation of storage mm -hmm. or auxiliary living or using the space, foam always has to be separated from people with a thermal barrier. Okay. Gotcha. So in this case, when we look at this, unfortunately, a lot of the, you know, where do people keep their Christmas ornaments? Mm -hmm. Up in the attic. Well, if your attic was 70 degrees year round instead of 170 in Texas, where would you put all your stuff? Up here. Okay. So that means we have to have a thermal barrier. And unfortunately, there's just a lot of builds that happened over the years or sheds or agricultural buildings that never got coated. The coating that is on this, you, you can notice that all of this does not look like the standard foam. The yeah, standard foam is going to be yellow. Yep, yeah, it's got a whitish color to it. Right. This is several mils of a white intumescent paint. So it is a paint that basically my choice is I can have a 15 minute thermal barrier, which would be a drywall, mm -hmm. or I can go with a coating that is compliant with a 15 minute test. Okay. So this DC 315 actually complies with that testing. There's a lot of solids in this bucket. And so it's very thick, but if you ever played with the snakes on the 4th of July, the little mm -hmm. graphite pellets, yep. same type of stuff in here, ah. those pellets will expand once you light them on fire. This will do exactly the same thing. You know what would be fun, Ken? I saw you've got a couple of uh, surfboards of foam that were sprayed as testers. Why don't we light one of those on fire and let's see how it burns? It. And then let's spray paint one with this D DC 315 and let's see how that burns. I'm all in. Let's cut to that. All right, guys, a little driveway dumpster fire test. We've got an uncoated piece of spray foam here. If that catches fire, we're going to show you what that looks like. And then we're going to show you that same foam that's got this DC 315 intumescent paint coating on it, which is what we're using on the attic. So that being said, let me start the GoPros. And Ken, let's light up the torch. One thing I want you to notice, Matt, though, foam is one of the most tested products in the industry. This is actually going out on its own. When I remove the flame, the foam goes out. But when you saw that amount of smoke, we can't have that kind of smoke inside someone's house. Smoke development's the biggest deal. So the coated stuff, we shouldn't have the same results. 
All right, now this is the same test with DC315 on there, which is an intumescent paint. Let's see if we're getting any smoke out of that DC315. So the next thing I want to make sure you see here is this char we're developing. This char is what is happening with the paint when we talked about it in the attic. Mm -hmm. So that char that we're developing, you notice we don't develop that over here. This yep. will only shrink and char, but it totally degrades the foam. So what I want to do is I'm going to knock some of this char off. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Look next, at that. next thing I want to show you, Matt, so not only did it do it twice, where I damaged it by putting this in, the flame got behind there, but it still did not completely change the foam. Mm -hmm. Here, we didn't burn through the foam, but had we put it on it that long, we certainly would have. Yep. yep. Take a look at this. Nothing on the back. Feel that. Not even hot. Yeah, that's crazy. Not hot. So that intumescent paint is actually kind of expanding and blowing up to protect that surface. Up to 2,000%. In fact, what was happening when you got close, if you think of the little pellets on the 4th of July that mm -hmm. they call snakes and you light those and they grow and yep. kids will almost get their finger real close to them, this, as it expands, produces carbon dioxide, which is a cold gas. So it's taking oxygen, it's pushing the flame away from the foam, and it's cooling the room down. Cool. Incredible technology. Yeah, that's a good safeguard for an attic that's going to have storage, and that's going to meet code to be approved for attic use. And uh, you're going to also want to double check your ICCES reports to show which one of those is approved and also the thickness, correct, Ken? Yes, you cannot just put any intumescent coating over any foam. In order to be approved, you have to use a coating that's actually matched to that foam, mm -hmm. and you have to put it on at a thickness that is approved. Right. The thickness we've got on here, we're running at 115 square feet per gallon. Okay. There are others in the industry that are all, all the way down into the 60s per square foot. Wow. So sometimes you have to put on double this. Right. But in this case, we've got the one that covers the greatest amount of territory in the industry and that's why we use it. That's pretty cool. All right, let's get back to the attic. Okay, so that means we have to have a thermal barrier. And unfortunately, there's just a lot of builds that happened over the years or sheds or agricultural buildings that never got coated and they just have foam. And you saw what happened to the foam mm -hmm. yep. by itself. Yep. So the great part is this is not that expensive. It's certainly a lot easier than putting drywall over this entire attic yeah. in order to protect you from the foam. And, and a whole lot less uh, money involved too. Now the way that you figure out whether you need this though is there's uh, going to be an ICCES report. You have several. That's going to be available through the manufacturer's website and that's going to yes. tell you if this foam is going to be in this type of environment, what coating is necessary uh, to protect it, right? Yes, so there's ICCES is one of the approving organizations or one of the organizations that reads all of your testing. These compliance reports, once you read them, you can go right down, it's usually section four, will tell you whether or not they're approved without an ignition barrier, meaning we're not doing any storage, mm -hmm. or what it takes for them to comply as, you know, thermal barrier protection in that attic or in that space. Gotcha. So you have to make sure that the coating you're using is approved with that specific foam. Got it. As long as you got that, you're golden. And so this DC315, would this actually be called out by name in some of those reports or not necessarily? DC315 actually on their website has a matrix that shows you all of the foams they're compliant with. They're actually ah. the most tested. They have, I believe, over 200 different compliance tests that they list on there. Very cool. So I could be wrong on the number, but it is far and away the most tested in the industry. Okay, good deal. So guys, we got into the weeds a little bit on conditioned, uh, unvented attics, but really what the point that Ken and I wanted to show you was that 
with a little bit of forethought uh, and not necessarily any particular product. We showed you two different versions of it. You can change your attic from the typical vented attic that you saw earlier um, to an attic like this. Now these are both new construction jobs. It's certainly easier to do it in new construction, but that could be a retrofit or remodel situation as well. If you're doing that, there's a little bit more work. There's, uh, there's more thought to go into how to do it. But on a house like this, now that we've got this spray foam in place, we've got the DC 315 in, the ductwork is gonna live in the air conditioned space. This is a beautiful attic. And just like you saw in the other house, don't forget about your fresh air. When you build a really tight envelope, a really tight house with this vent, non-vented conditioned attic, you gotta think about fresh air. One of those pipes right there is to the outside that's fresh air. It's gonna get connected to the zender. One of them is an exhaust pipe, that's an ERV. And then all these tubes are tubes that are either supply fresh air or exhaust air out of the house because it's a balanced system. I got a great video, I'll put it in the link in the description about the Zender at my house and how it works and how it uh, operates. But Ken, thank you so much for joining me thank on you. today's video. Uh, IDI is a fantastic uh, distributor with all kinds of diff different insulation supplies. And you know, Ken and I, you can only imagine how much we've nerded out of the years over <laughs> insulation quite a bit. Guys, if you're not currently a subscriber, we've got new content here at The Build Show every Tuesday and every Friday. Hit that subscribe button. Otherwise, follow me on Twitter or Instagram. We'll see you next time on The Build Show.